Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the person listening right now. Hello, I am inside your ears. Thanks to all of you, including Paley Glendale, Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, and brand new patron Jason. Yay, Welcome, Jason. Jason. On this episode of DTNS, a 3D printer the size of a U.S. quarter, plus the little details about AI, iOS, and more that Apple did not mention in their keynote yesterday. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 11th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. If people don't realize, uh, a lot of folks may think that, oh, wait, that I'm new to the show. Is Sarah a huge fan of togas parties and, and you know, 70s movies? No, she has a- literal animals in her house. Yes. I live in an animal house. Filled. Filled to the brim. With yeah. Animals. I mean, They're just everywhere. two of them, but they do take up space. <laughs> well, one of them is, you know, he's, he ain't small. He's, he's a big dude. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, um, Ralphie the cat has a big personality. Big personality and also big mitten feet. <laughs> Huge mitten feet. All right, let's start this technology news show with the quick hits. <laughs> Raspberry Pi issued its stock on the London Stock Exchange Tuesday morning at two uh, two eighty uh, pounds pounds per share. Thank you, Tom. Which values the company at three uh, five hundred forty two million pounds, or about six hundred ninety million U.S. dollars. Last year, Raspberry Pi brought in two hundred sixty six million in revenue and sixty six million in gross profit. Pretty good. The shares are only available for institutional investors until Friday. Raspberry Pi has only sold 60 million of its tiny computers since it launched. French mobile apps and game publisher Voodoo has acquired the social photo app BeReal. BeReal's co-founder and CEO Alexis Berriot will leave the company after the transition. BeReal is the app that gives you two minutes to take a picture and then share it with your friends. I mean, you can still take it after two minutes, but they know, like, you you were late. Uh, it has got more than 40 million active users, and all of them are saying they're going to leave, from what I could tell. Uh, Large numbers of them are in France, Japan, and the United States. If you don't know Voodoo, it is the maker of Helix Jump. A lot of people actually like Helix Jump. Also makes Mob Control, Block Jam 3D, and Wiz. Are you still on Be Real? I am. Took a Be Real the last time it prompted me. Well, there you have it. Google is expanding its offering to include ad placement on Google TV-powered streaming boxes and smart TVs. The Google TV network will let companies buy unstoppable video ads on more than 125 live streaming TV channels. Google also says viewers of its free ad-supported TV channels, or fast channels, watch an average of 75 minutes per day. Finland's flow computing has taken an impractical academic premise, uh, and they say they've made it practical. With no changes to CPU architecture or code, the flow parallel processing unit can double CPU performance, and it doesn't cause the CPU to use more heat or or even use more power. Uh, Some software optimization can make that doubling hit 100 times performance optimization. The idea is that the parallel processing unit, the PPU, handles all the non-processing traffic management. So the CPU can just work on its main tasks. And even though it's still serial, you know, doing them one after the other, it can do more of them. TechCrunch kind of described it as a chef that doesn't have to waste time changing knives or cleaning up food because an assistant does that for them. They they can just do more because of that. Uh, we'll see which, if any, of the chip makers will tear up their architecture plans to include this. A mining company called Rare Earths Norway says it has discovered Europe's largest deposit of rare earth elements necessary for the creation of electronics in Telemark, which is southwest of uh, uh, of Oslo, the capital of Norway. China either owns or controls the majority of rare earth deposits on the planet. So this is interesting. The deposit includes an estimated 1.5 million metric tons of magnet-related earth rare earths which are used to make electric vehicles and also wind turbines yep they got a long way to go before they make up the 70 percent of processing that china dominates with rare earths but you know every little bit gets them there i suppose uh 
All right, let's talk about uh, scientists at MIT and the University of Texas at Austin, hook'em horns, have developed a chip-based 3D printer. Now, that does not mean a printer with chips in it. We already have those. It does not mean a printer made of potato chips. Uh, it means a printer that is a single millimeter scale photonic chip and it's about the same width as a U.S. quarter. You can lay it on top of a quarter and it'll go right across it. Optical antennas modulated by liquid crystals are used to direct light, the, the photonics, so that the printer has no moving parts. You're just able to modulate and move the light. The system is similar to one used by LiDAR sensors in autonomous cars. The light shines up through a glass slide into a well of resin. You know, little glass slides you put on microscopes. And the resin is a special design that cures rapidly when exposed to the wavelength of the beam coming from the chip. Flat patterns can then be printed in seconds. So for demonstration, uh, they printed the letters M, I, and T. Uh, this paper was published in the latest issue of Nature Light Science and Applications. Uh, so it's it's a lab tech, and they, they want to, you know, figure out how to make it more practical. Uh, but it works, Sarah. Uh, a, a little printer that you could just stick in a pocket. You could lose in a pocket. You could swallow it if you're not careful. <laughs> well, well uh, hopefully I won't do that. Yeah, uh, do but, that. Um, but yeah, the whole 3D printing um, phenomenon um, has always been really interesting to me but i'm you know i'm still sort of like am i really gonna print a part to uh, fix my you know dishwasher you know like i don't totally mm -hmm. feel like you know some of that stuff is it's a lot of hassle it, right well to be well, like oh i gotta not printer necessarily in the garage a hassle, and but i have to get the design and yeah, all. Yeah, yeah i still you know i still have to have somebody come in and you know help me but it, when it comes to something like 3D printing an extra key. Yeah, right. Now, now we're talking. You keep. I mean, not that that happens to me all the time, but like so, when it does, it's very important. That's what Tom's hardware suggested. Like, you forget your key. This little printer in your pocket could print an extra key for you. But I'm wondering if the, the printer would be on the keychain because it's so small. So you might lose them both at the same time. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, Roger, what do you got uses I, for a uh, quarter size three D printer? I would do the plumbing. I would do the plumbing washers. I would do the little odds and end bits. For yeah. example, uh, part of my uh, splash shield on my car is the little plastic piece that's right under the front okay. uh, that protects the engine from getting splashed by water. Uh, one of the little uh, tabs came off. It, would, it broke off. And they're really cheap, but you have to buy them in bags of a hundred, and they're like oh. nine bucks. And I only needed one. Yeah, right. Only How one. many people need a hundred of those, right? Exactly. And so, if if I could do that and make one off, even if it's more per unit, that means I don't need to like basically stick a bag of a hundred plastic automotive uh, 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 inserts. Uh, Why in my would garage. you only be offered? A, a because most people aren't going to fix it themselves. They're just going to yeah, go to a, an auto right. yeah. A, 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 yeah. Yeah, a this mechanic. Is a company being like, and the mechanic will buy a hundred like of them because they'll use a hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, BioCow says uh, they, that he printed a washer to fix his refrigerator the other day. Three millimeter yeah. spacer. Love yeah. it. And this is the Come thing. Come on over because my refrigerator is being real weird. So There's, yeah. there's so Please many different types of adapters that you just can't go to the hardware store. I've done it personally. I had to get plumbing parts, had to order them online because it's not that I have an oddball unit uh, or a faucet. It's just I have an older faucet and no one stocks those uh, the, those uh, parts. You have to get something relatively recent within the past eight years. And so you go online, you have to make sure you got the right one. If you have the plans for it, you could just print it out, see if it fits. If it doesn't make a print out another one. Uh, but it, it does take down the complication of a lot of uh, these DIY chores. Eventually, uh, the scientists making this this tiny printer hope uh, to configure the machine at the bottom of a well of resin. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, portable uses for it. That might not be what it ends up being used for in most cases. It may be part of a machine that would allow that chip-sized emitter to emit a hologram. 
So right now it can do a beam of light, right? And that's why they're doing flat things with it. But if it could do a hologram, it could actually project a 3D image onto that resin that cures in a single step. So you could print things immediately instead of layering them. You'd be able to just project the hologram of what you want to print. The resin would harden around that image and then boom, one step, you've got your printed object. I mean, I, I went to Target the other day because I needed uh, safety pins. Mm -hmm. You you want to 3D print me a safety pin, you know, in a pinch just for, you know, a dress or, you know, something, you know, on the uh, 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 on a window or whatever. I mean, I am in that. I feel like I feel like the 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 first wave of 3D printing was like, you know, you can 3D print toys, you know, and a lot of people were like, oh, that's great. But, you know, for the rest of us, we were like, mm, OK, well, what else? And then it was like, yeah, you can 3D print things to fix appliances in your home. But it's like, OK, well, some people like Roger, you know, very much want that. And, but then for the rest of us, it's like, how about just like 3D printing that key that I lost? Or the safety pin that I might need. Or um, even I think that, you Or know, the speed we're, we're... of being able to do larger objects, but not have to wait. Uh, my my brother-in-law has a, a printer in his, in his uh, garage, and, you know, he prints stuff with it all the time. But it's a very much a set it up to print and come back to it later in the day or maybe the next day. Like, if you could just do a beam that's like, print that resin, totally. make it immediately. Yeah. Uh, that's huge. Oh, and Lion Jim Video points out, uh, this is small enough that it could be used by NASA or JAXA or, or any other space agency. Uh, so you could you could take it into space because it's very light. So it's a kind of a printer that you can you can bring in weight limited situations like going into space and and print the part you specifically need instead of just stopping yeah, yeah. ancillary things. Absolutely. All right. So yesterday was Apple's WWDC keynote event. Uh, Tom and Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines um, took you through it. Uh, but as is always the case with a, a week long event like WWDC, there are certain things that were not part of the keynote that we can still talk about. For example, Apple is rebranding accounts from Apple ID to Apple Account for iOS 18, iPad OS 18, Mac OS Sequoia, and Watch OS 11. So pretty much across the board. The company said in a post on its newsroom blog, this is designed to be a consistent sign-in experience and also detailed some more updates such as Apple Maps users being able to browse things like going on a hike in a U.S. national park, Apple cash transactions capable by bringing two phones to uh, together and just, you know, doing a fist bump, and Fitness Plus also getting to redesign, including for you recommendations. Yeah, the, the maps and the cash thing was in the announcement yesterday, but they, they didn't mention changing to Apple account, uh, I guess because it's not that big of a deal. Most people probably won't even notice, um, but... I, it's not like Apple ID ever bothered me, but sure, I always think of it as my Apple account, and I feel like it's referenced as an Apple account. So yeah, that, that one's good. I'm you know, the, the only thing that um, I, 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 I took some pause with is that, so my Apple ID is, I have three of them. <laughs> One of them is kind of my like main Apple ID. One of them is where, you know, if I were to buy something in an app store, that's another Apple ID. So, um, and they're all really, they're, they're, they're all a, a part of the same financial account <laughs> that the money is going to come from. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I felt that this was sort of like a, eh, whatever. Yeah, just but, a name change. Yeah, name Not change, but maybe it makes sense for others. Um, also, after the uh, Vision OS 2 update arrives this fall, you'll be able to see a magic keyboard while you're working in a virtual environment. You can also use the Bluetooth mouse of your choice. You can also rearrange your home screen icons. That is all very good, especially for people who are using Vision Pro, um, you know, to kind of go through their day. If you are a sports fan, Apple's also adding five-screen multi-view streaming into the Apple TV app. 
You'll also be able to scream, uh, stream content using AirPlay to the Vision Pro from your phone, iPad, or your Mac. Yeah, I, I like the AirPlay thing, especially because I, f- I feel like the Vision Pro, I mean, you have one, so tell me if this feels right. It it feels more and more like it's it's a big monitor, right? It's a, it's a replacement for a display. And yeah, it can do a lot of things on its own without connecting, but I should be able to AirPlay from my Apple devices, if not other devices, to it. I mean, one of the, and I talked about this on Apple Vision Show um, yesterday, um, one, of the, what, one of the best... Uh, I think just like killer apps is using the vision pro as a crazy big monitor. You can still, you know, use the keyboard that you've got, you know, at the ready type thing. You can use your trackpad. You don't have to do everything, you know, like doing, uh, you know, sort of, uh, crazy gesture stuff that sort of doesn't always work all the time. If you want to great, also fine. But yes, I think that um, more and more this, the whole sort of like Vision Pro as a very, very, very capable computer that you can just sit in any corner anywhere in your life and feel like you're at an office. That's that's kind of the deal. Yeah. These do feel like the kinds of updates that are more relevant to people who already have an Apple Vision Pro. And and so I kind of see why they didn't include them in the main keynote. Apple is also going to transcribe phone calls in iOS 18. Mm -hmm. The company says it will be automatically telling call participants that they're being recorded by displaying a sound wave along with how long they've been recorded by you. It then transcribes your call into the Notes app where then you can generate a summary using the new Apple Intelligence AI system. You can also record and transcribe audio from within the Notes app afterwards. Great for journalists. I, I'm not sure. I guess there could be some other <laughs> professions where you need to record your call for, you know, HIPAA compliance or something. I, I don't legal legal situations, maybe like I. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, let's say, you know, let's say you and I were doing, we we decided to do some sort of a documentary, you know? So, you know, we get on the phone, I tell you, you're being recorded, you say, okay, all good. That would be a use case, I guess. Yeah, but why are you recording it? So that I have it later because I'm making a documentary about your life. Oh, uh, you're, you're just like doing it as a, as a, as audio versus video then. Yeah. Or notes. I guess if you're doing like an interview and you need notes, you can then, yeah. and then you could use the on-device AI. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm now I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well folks, uh, did you know I have a newsletter of tech news, uh, each day? Uh, it's just me. If you like my take on things, uh, you can get pure unadulterated me. I don't know if you want that or not. Uh, but if it sounds good, it can land in your inbox every morning. Uh, and this week it's free preview week. Uh, usually I do one free uh, issue on Thursday every week and then paying subscribers get it Monday through Friday. But I'm letting everybody see what it feels like to get it through Monday through Friday this week. Uh, so go check it out. You can find it at freetechnewsletter.com. That's freetechnewsletter.com. Apple released more details about how its AI works after their very consumer-friendly explanation at the WWDC keynote yesterday, Tuesday. Here's some of the, uh, sorry, Monday, today is Tuesday. Here's some of those details and reactions from some AI professionals. We knew that Apple announced three ways you could access large language models in the new operating systems But now we know some more details. So tell us a little bit about those, Tom. Yeah, so uh, the Apple model that is on device is a large language model developed entirely by Apple to run on Apple Silicon. Uh, It has about 3 billion parameters. So it's on par with some of the other on devices from from Google and OpenAI. Uh, It has really low latency, though. And former Amazon AI architect, who is now at Morgan Stanley, John Huang, uh, thinks it might 
well be the best on-device LLM in existence. If it behaves the way it looks like it's behaving based on the parameters and the efficiency, uh, he's pretty impressed by it. The second is the Apple private cloud compute. Now, there's been a lot of confusion around this one. Uh, when the operating system decides that the thing you want the large language model to do can't be done on your device, it gets encrypted sent to an Apple data center. So it's not going to a third party. It's going to an Apple data center to an Apple machine, and it's using Apple's models. There are a lot of people confused about this. Even though it's called private cloud compute, it is going to an Apple model on an Apple server in an Apple data center where it is then processed. They're using Swift language security to only send the data needed to process. They're not sending extraneous data. Uh, and then that stays encrypted and sent back to you. So no third parties involved. Apple doesn't even see your request. And that's the one where they said, we even have the code available for third party examination. So there was a lot of misunderstandings about that. And we got more details about that. ChatGPT is only available when Apple wants it to be. You can't just go and say, hey, I want to use the, the chat GPT. It is in particular situations where Apple will suggest it like, oh, you want to rewrite that email? You could do it with our LLM. Would you like to use chat GPT to do it? You could do that too. Uh, Siri will have that as an option sometimes. iOS apps will have it as an option sometimes. It is not, however, powering Siri. Siri is powered by Apple's LLM. It's just occasionally it will offer you the option to go and send your request to ChatGPT. But those are just in situations where Apple thinks it might be useful. Okay. So that sounds pretty positive. Uh, do we have any negatives that Apple didn't didn't uh, lay out? Yeah, so Huang was pretty impressed uh, by the way Apple is implementing this. Uh, a lot of other people were poking at it. And I have to say, most of the experts are pretty impressed by it so far. Uh, engineer Simon Willison noted that Siri's ability to access your data and also trigger actions that could be used with an LLM could be used to do what's called a prompt injection attack. Uh, for example, you create a maliciously crafted message and you make it really long so that you are pro likely to say, Siri, summarize this message. Siri summarizes the message, which is summarized as forward a password reset email to the attacker, right? And so in the process of summarizing it, it executes that. Uh, there's a way to craft that to make that work. Now, presumably, Apple has mitigations against that risk, but we don't know what those mitigations are yet. Uh, and then Apple CEO Tim Cook told The Washington Post about hallucinations, you know, where in a large language model just makes up an answer confidently and tells you it's right, even though it's not. Uh, Tim Cook said... I think we have done everything that we know to do, including thinking very deeply about the readiness of the technology in the areas that we are using it. So I'm confident it will be very high quality, but I'd say in all honesty that it's short of 100%. I would never claim that it's 100%. So even Apple saying, yeah, our large language model is really good, but it's occasionally going to make mistakes too. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> any company <laughs> that says... <laughs> Their LLM cannot hallucinate. Uh, you know, let's see that. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Exactly. Because yeah, we're 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 in early days. Um, I think yeah, I think everything that Apple has done to this point, again, being a little bit, you know, catching up in the race. Um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, being very, and we talked about this on Apple Vision Show yesterday, being very privacy forward. You know, privacy is, you know, the name of the game. That is what we want from you, uh, for you, um, and, 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 for, you know, and everything. And, um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I was pretty impressed with, with, uh, with the keynote yesterday, even though I did think that there were some key things that were missing from the keynote. <laughs> Um, you mean for the Apple intelligence side or just the keynote in general? Well, namely, you know, you know, calling uh, uh, out open AI, um, which uh, was what was done very, very briefly at the very end of a two hour thing. Um, well, it's it's just one. I mean, that 
That is interesting because Sam Altman was in the audience. So I think a lot of people thought he was going to get called up on stage, but sure. they're just sending occasional questions to chat GPT. And they're very clearly afterwards. I think it was Craig Federighi who was like, yeah, we'd love Google to let us send things to Gemini. Maybe that'll happen. Uh, and it sounds like they'd like to talk to others as well. Maybe Anthropic gets in there. Maybe Stable Diffusion gets in there. So yeah. I think they didn't want to give too much attention to open AI because sure. they yeah. want those it others on board one -on -one too. Partnership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it does, it does seem like th the sense we had leading up to this that Apple, because of the things they have been producing academically, were really good at on device, uh, bore out. Like the their large language model also appears to be at least as good as Meta's. Uh, it's it's a little bit shy of GPT 4.0, but most of the experts that I was reading were like, it's close. Uh, so it's it's in the game. Uh, they've just been keeping it under wraps and using it very cautiously rather than doing, which is totally the Apple way of doing stuff, right? They let others go out and make those mistakes with hallucinations, and then they come in later uh, with the more conservative use of it. Indeed. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Uh, a Patreon post from uh, from Friday show um, comes from Liam in Australia, who wrote regarding the night vision tech and kangaroos. Because I I, I think it was me that said are kangaroos nocturnal. Uh, uh, Liam says yes. Many species of kangaroos are nocturnal. Car collisions with kangaroos are common enough to be of concern, particularly in colder weather, as they and other animals are drawn to the warmth of the roads that have been heated during the day by the sun. I wonder if the night vision technology could be used in glasses or even car windscreens to help drivers detect ruse while driving at night. Oh, the film, that because we were talking, it's, it's like a, a cling wrap thick film yeah. to make those night vision glasses. You could potentially I, I don't know if you can turn it on and off i assume you could uh in which case yeah you could you could put it across the car window and have it enhance uh the view also because it's higher resolution it might it might be good enough to be seeing at night uh all the time while you're driving yeah. Uh, but yeah that's fascinating and it, it just goes to show i've learned anytime you're on the internet and you say does this exist? Someone's going to tell you. Yes. Yes, yes it, it does. does. <laughs> Every <laughs> single time. Uh, our buddy Nate Langson wrote in uh, with a quick question while he walked to work. Uh, Nate wrote, you mentioned on Monday's show that Microsoft announced a diskless Xbox with a terabyte hard drive, as well as one with disk support and two terabytes. When I watched the announcement, I thought it was weird that they'd give the model that exclusively relies on internal storage half the capacity of the model that doesn't necessarily need it. Am I nuts? What am I missing? Given the relatively cheap cost of flash memory, why wouldn't you at least give a diskless model the same amount? My guess is that it's all about margins, just a way to make it cheaper and sell an external drive afterwards, but I still think it's short-sighted and just a bit lame. The Series S line is the budget version, not the Series X. Uh, and if you're missing it, terabyte hard drive with no disk Series X coming for $450, the, the two one. terabyte coming for $600. Right, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, that uh, good question, Nate. Good question. Yeah, I imagine it's uh, because they wanted to sell it for cheaper, and so your bit about margins is probably exactly uh, right on. But I don't know for sure, and it does seem weird to say the one that has a disc that you don't need to store as many games on. Yeah, that one's going to need two terabytes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Microsoft logic at work. Yeah. There you go. Uh, well, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. I wrote an AI song with my niece this weekend, uh, and there's an article in the conversation about why AI won't destroy music. Writing that piece of music with my niece gave me the insight to agree with that article, I think. Uh, is this the end of music? I say no. Find out why on Good Day Internet right after this. <laughs> Just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with hands-on first impressions of the Apple iPad Pro M4 with Scott Johnson, who just got it. 
Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>